Chapter Twenty Two of She. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. She by H. Rider Haggard. Job has a presentiment. It was nine o'clock on the following morning when Job who still looked scared and frightened, came in to call me, and at the same time breathed his gratitude at finding us alive in our beds, which it appeared was more than he had expected. When I told him of the awful end of poor Ustain, he was even more grateful at our survival, and much shocked, though Ustain had been no favourite of his or he of hers for the matter of that. She had called him pig in bastard Arabic, and he called her hussy in good English. But these amenities were forgotten in the face of the catastrophe that had overwhelmed her at the hands of her queen. I don't want to say anything as may not be agreeable, sir, said Job, when he had finished exclaiming at my tale. But it's my opinion that, that there she is the old gentleman himself, or perhaps his wife, if he has one, which I suppose he has, for he couldn't be so wicked all by himself. The witch of Endor was a fool to her, sir. Bless you, she would make no more of raising every gentleman in the Bible out of these here beastly tombs than I should of growing cress on an old flannel. It's a country of devils, this is, sir and she is the master one of the lot. And if ever we get out of it, it'll be more than I expect to do. I don't see no way out of it. That witch isn't likely to let a fine young man like Mr. Leo go. Come, I said, at any rate she saved his life. Yes, and she will take his soul to pay for it. She will make him a witch like herself. I say it's wicked to have anything to do with those sort of people. Last night, sir, I lay awake and read in my little Bible that my poor old mother gave me about what is going to happen to sorceresses and them sort, till my hair stood on end. Lord, how the old lady would stare if she saw where her job had got to. Yes, it's a queer country, and a queer people too, Job, I answered with a shy, for, though I am not superstitious like Job, I admit to a natural shrinking, which will not bear investigation, from the things that are above nature. You are right, sir, he answered, and if you won't think me very foolish, I should like to say something to you now that Mr. Leo is out of the way. Leo had got up early and gone for a stroll. And that is that I know it is the last country as ever I shall see in this world. I had a dream last night, and I dreamed that I saw my old father with a kind of night shirt on him, something like these folks wear when they want to be in particular full dress, and a bit of that feathery grass in his hand, which he may have gathered on the way, for I saw lots of it yesterday about three hundred yards from the mouth of this beastly cave. Job, he said to me, solemn-like, and yet with a kind of satisfaction shining through him, more like a methody parson when he has sold a neighbor a marked horse for a sound one, and cleared twenty pounds by the job than anything I can think on. Job, time's up, Job, but I never did expect to have to come and hunt you out in this ear place, Job. Such ado as I have had to nose you up. It wasn't friendly to give your poor old father such a run, let alone that a wonderful lot of bad characters hail from this place, Cor. Regular cautions, I suggested. Yes, sir, of course, sir. That's just what he said they was. Cautions, downright scorchers, sir, and I'm sure I don't doubt it, seeing what I know of them and their hot-potting ways went on Job sadly. Anyway, he was sure that time was up, and went away saying that we should see more than we cared for of each other soon, and I suppose he was a thinking of the fact that, 
father and i never could hit off together for longer nor three days and i dare say that things will be similar when we meet again surely i said you don't think that you are going to die because you dreamed you saw your old father if one dies because one dreams of one's father what happens to a man who dreams of his mother-in-law ah sir you are laughing at me said job but you see you didn't know my old father if it had been anybody else my aunt mary for instance who never made much of a job i should not have thought so much of it but my father was that idle which he shouldn't have been with seventeen children that he would never have put himself out to come here just to see the place no sir i know that he meant business well sir i can't help it i suppose every man must go some time or other though it is a hard thing to die in a place like this where christian burial isn't to be had for its weight in gold i have tried to be a good man sir and do my duty honest and if it wasn't for the supercilious kind of way in which father carried on last night a sort of sniffing at me as it were as though he hadn't no opinion of my references and testimonials i should feel easy enough in my mind anyway sir i have been a good servant to you and mr leo bless him why it seems but the other day that i used to lead him about the streets with a penny whip and if ever you get out of this place which as father didn't allude to you perhaps you may i hope you will think kindly of my whitened bones and never have anything more to do with greek writing on flower pots sir if i may make so bold as to say so come come job i said seriously this is all nonsense you know you must not be silly enough to go getting such ideas into your head we have lived through some queer things and i hope that we may go on doing so no sir answered job in a tone of conviction that jarred on me unpleasantly it isn't nonsense i am a doomed man and i feel it and a wonderful uncomfortable feeling it is sir for one can't help wondering how it's going to come about if you are eating your dinner you think of poison and it goes against your stomach and if you are walking along these dark rabbit burrows you think of knives and lord don't you just shiver about the back i ain't particular sir provided it's sharp like that poor girl who now that she's gone i'm sorry to have spoke hard on though i don't approve of her morals in getting married which i consider too quick to be decent still sir and poor job turned a shade paler as he said it i do hope it won't be that hot pot game nonsense i broke in angrily nonsense very well sir said job it isn't my place to differ from you sir but if you happen to be going anywhere sir i should be obliged if you could manage to take me with you seeing that i shall be glad to have a friendly face to look at when the time comes just to help one through as it were and now sir i'll be getting the breakfast and he went leaving me in a very uncomfortable state of mind i was deeply attached to old job who was one of the best and honestest men i have ever had to do with in any class of life and really more of a friend than a servant and the mere idea of anything happening to him brought a lump into my throat beneath all his ludicrous talk i could see that he himself was quite convinced that something was going to happen and though in most cases these convictions turn out to be utter moonshine and this particular one especially was to be amply accounted for by the gloomy and unaccustomed surroundings in which its victims was placed still it did more or less carry a chill to my heart as any dread that is obviously a genuine object of belief is apt to do however absurd the belief may be presently the breakfast arrived and with it leo who had been taking a walk outside the cave to clear his mind he said and very glad i was to see both for they gave me a respite from my gloomy thoughts after breakfast we went for another walk and watched some of the amahagars sowing a plot of ground with the grain from which they make their beer 
This they did in scriptural fashion. A man with a bag made of goat's hide fastened round his waist, walking up and down the plot and scattering the seeds as he went. It was a positive relief to see one of these dreadful people do anything so homely and pleasant as sow a field, perhaps because it seemed to link them, as it were, with the rest of humanity. As we were returning, Bilali met us, and informed us that it was she's pleasure that we should wait upon her, and accordingly we entered her presence, not without trepidation, for Asha was certainly an exception to the rule. Familiarity with her might, and did breed passion and wonder and horror, but it certainly did not breed contempt. We were, as usual, shown in by the mutes, and after these had retired, Asha unveiled, and once more bade Leo embrace her, which, notwithstanding his hard searchings of the previous night, he did with more alacrity and fervour than in strictness courtesy required. She laid her white hand on his head and looked him fondly in the eyes. Dost thou wonder, my calicrates, she said, when thou shalt call me all thine own, and when we shall of a truth be for one another and to one another? I will tell thee. First must thou be even as I am, not immortal indeed, for that I am not but so cased and hardened against the attacks of time that his arrows shall glance from the armour of thy vigorous life as the sunbeams glance from water. As yet I may not mate with thee, for thou and I are different, and the very brightness of my being would burn thee up and perchance destroy thee. Thou couldst not even endure to look upon me for too long a time, lest thine eyes should ache, and thy senses swim, and therefore, with a little nod, shall I presently wheel myself again? This, by the way, she did not do. No, listen, thou shalt not be tried beyond endurance, for this very evening, an hour before the sun goes down, shall we start hence and by to-morrow's dark, if all goes well, and the road is not lost to me, which I pray it may not be, shall we stand in the place of life, and thou shalt bathe in the fire, and come forth glorified, as no man ever was before thee, and then, Calicrates, shalt thou call me wife, and I will call thee husband. Leo muttered something in answer to this astonishing statement. I do not know what, and she laughed a little at his confusion, and went on. And thou too, O holy, on thee also will I confer this boon, and then of a truth shalt thou be evergreen, and this will I do. Well, because thou hast pleased me. Holy, for thou art not altogether a fool, like most of the sons of men, and because though thou hast a school of philosophy as full of nonsense as those of the old days yet hast thou not forgotten how to turn a pretty phrase about a lady's eyes hello old fellow whispered leo with a return of his old cheerfulness have you been paying compliments i should never have thought it of you i thank thee o asha i replied with as much dignity as i could command but if there be such a place as thou dost describe, and if in this strange place there may be found a fiery virtue that can hold off death when he comes to pluck us by the hand, yet would I none for it. For me, O oh Asha, the wall has not proved so soft a nest that I would lie in it for ever. A stony-hearted mother is our earth, and stones are the bread she gives her children for their daily food stones to eat and bitter water for their thirst and stripes for tender nurture who would endure this for many lives who would so load up his back with memories of lost hours and loves and of his neighbour's sorrows that he cannot listen and wisdom that brings not consolation hard is it to die because our delicate flesh doth shrink back from the worm it will not feel and from that unknown which the winding sheet doth curtain from our view but harder still to my fancy 
would it be to live on green in the leaf and fair but dead and rotten at the core and feel that other secret warm of recollection growing over at the heart bethink thee holy she said yet doth long life and strength and beauty beyond measure mean power and all things that are dear to man and what o queen i answered are those things that are dear to man are they not bubbles is not ambition but an endless ladder by which no height is ever climbed till the last unreachable rung is mounted for height leads on to the height and there is no resting place upon them and rung doth grow upon rung and there is no limit to the number doth not wealth satiate and become nauseous and no longer serve to satisfy or pleasure or to buy an hour's peace of mind and is there any end to wisdom that we may hope to reach it rather the more we learn shall we not thereby be able only to better compass out our ignorance did we live ten thousand years could we hope to solve the secrets of the suns and of the space beyond the suns and of the hand that hung them in the heavens would not our wisdom be but as a gnawing hunger calling our consciousness day by day to a knowledge of the empty craving of our souls would it not be but as a light in one of these great caverns that though bright it burn and brighter yet doth but the more serve to show the depths of the gloom around it and what good thing is there beyond that we may gain by length of days nay my holy there is love love which makes all things beautiful and doth breathe divinity into the very dust we tread with love shall life roll gloriously on from year to year like the voice of some great music that hath power to hold the hearer's heart poised on eagle's wings above the sordid shame and folly of the earth it may be so i answered but if the loved one prove a broken reed to pierce us or if the love be loved in vain what then shall a man grave his sorrows upon a stone when he hath but need to write them on the water nay o she i will live my day and grow old with my generation and die my appointed death and be forgotten for i do hope for an immortality to which the little span that perchance thou canst confer will be but as a finger's length laid against the measure of the great world and mark this the immortality to which i look and which my faith doth promise me shall be free from the bonds that here must tie my spirit down for while the flesh endures sorrow and evil and the scorpion whips of sin must endure also but when the flesh hath fallen from us then shall the spirit shine forth clad in the brightness of eternal good and for its common air shall breathe so rare an ether of most noble thoughts that the highest aspiration of our manhood or the purest incense of a maiden's prayer would prove too earthly grass to float therein thou lookest high answered asha with a little laugh and speakest clearly as a trumpet and with no uncertain sound and yet methinks that but now didst thou talk of that unknown from which the winding sheet doth curtain us but perchance thou seest with the eye of faith gazing on that brightness that is to be through the painted glass of thy imagination strange are the pictures of the future that mankind can thus draw with this brush of faith and this many-coloured pigment of imagination strange too that no one of them doth agree with another i could tell thee but there what is the use why rob a fool of his bauble let it pass and i pray o holy that when thou dost feel old age creeping slowly toward thyself and the confusion of senility making havoc in thy brain thou mayst not bitterly regret that thou didst cast away the imperial boon i would have given to thee but so it hath ever been man can never be content with that which his hand can pluck if a lamp be in his reach to light him through the darkness he must needs cast it down because it is no star happiness danceth 
ever a pace before him like the marsh fires in the swamps and he must catch the fire and he must hold the star beauty is not to him because there are lips more honey sweet and wealth is not because others can weigh him down with heavier shekels and fame is not because there have been greater men than he thyself thou saidst it and i turn thy words against thee well thou dreamest that thou shalt pluck the star i believe it not and i think thee a fool my holy to throw away the lamp i made no answer for i could not especially before leo tell her that since i had seen her face i knew that it would always be before my eyes and that i had no wish to prolong an existence which must always be haunted and tortured by her memory and by the last bitterness of unsatisfied love but so it was and so alas is it to this hour and now went on she changing her tone and the subject together tell me my calicrates for as yet i know it not how came ye to seek me here yesternight thou didst say that calicrates him whom thou sawest was thine ancestor how was it tell me thou dost not speak over much thus adjured leo told her the wonderful story of the casket and of the portrait that written on by his ancestress the egyptian amenartas had been the means of guiding us to her asha listened intently and when he had finished spoke to me did i not tell thee one day when we did talk of good and evil o holy it was when my beloved lay so ill that out of good came evil and out of evil good that they who sowed knew not what the crop should be nor he who struck where the blow should fall see now this egyptian amenartas this royal child of the nile who hated me and whom even now i hate for in a way she did prevail against me see now she herself hath been the very means to bring her lover to mine arms for her sake i slew him and now behold through her he hath come back to me she would have done me evil and sowed her seeds that i might reap tares and behold she hath given me more than all the world can give and there is a strange square for thee to fit into thy circle of good and evil o holy and so she went on after a pause and so she bade her son destroy me if he might because i slew his father and thou my calicrates art the father and in a sense thou art likewise the son and wouldst thou avenge thy wrong and the wrong of that far off mother of thine upon me o calicrates see and she slid to her knees and drew the white corsage still farther down her ivory bosom see here beats my heart and there by thy side is a knife heavy and long and sharp the very knife to slay an erring woman with take it now and be avenged strike and strike home so shalt thou be satisfied calicrates and go through life a happy man because thou hast paid back the wrong and obeyed the mandate of the past he looked at her and then stretched out his hand and lifted her to her feet rise asha he said sadly well thou knowest that i cannot strike thee no not even for the sake of her whom thou slewest but last night i am in thy power and a very slave to thee how can i kill thee sooner should i slay myself almost dost thou begin to love me calicrates she answered smiling and now tell me of thy country it's a great people is it not with an empire like that of rome surely thou wouldst return thither and it is well for i mean not that thou shouldst dwell in these caves of kor nay when once thou art even as i am we will go hence fear not but that i shall find a path and then shall we journey to this england of thine and live as it becometh us to live Two thousand years have I waited for the day when I should see the last of these hateful caves and this gloomy visaged folk, and now it is at hand, and my heart bounds up to meet it like a child's towards its holiday, for thou shalt rule this England. But we have a queen already," broke in Leo hastily. 
It is not, it is not, said Asa. She can be overthrown. At this we both broke out into an exclamation of dismay and explained that we should as soon think of overthrowing ourselves. But here is a strange thing, said Asha in astonishment. A queen whom her people love. Surely the world must have changed since I dwelt in Kor. Again we explained that it was the character of monarchs that had changed, and that the one under whom we lived was venerated and beloved by all right-thinking people in our vast realms. Also we told her that real power in our country rested in the hands of the people, and that we were in fact ruled by the votes of the lower and least educated classes of the community. Ah, she said, a democracy. Then surely there is a tyrant, for I have long since seen that democracies having no clear will of their own, in the end set up a tyrant and worship him. Yes, I said, we have our tyrants. Well, she answered resignedly, we can at any rate destroy these tyrants, and Calicrates shall rule the land. I instantly informed Asha that in England, Blasting was not an amusement that could be indulged in with impunity, and that any such attempt would meet with the consideration of the law, and probably end upon a scaffold. The law? She laughed with scorn. The law? Canst thou not understand, O oh holy, that I am above the law, and so shall my calicrates be also? All human law will be to us as the north wind to a mountain. Does the wind bend the mountain, or the mountain the wind? And now leave me, I pray thee, and thou too, my own Calicrates, for I would get me ready against our journey, and so must ye both, and your servant also. But bring no great quantity of things with thee, for I trust that we shall be but three days gone. Then shall we return hither, and I'll make a plan whereby... We can bid farewell forever to these sepulchres of Kor. Yea, surely thou mayst kiss my hand. So we went, I for one, meditating deeply on the awful nature of the problem that now opened out before us. The terrible she had evidently made up her mind to go to England, and it made me absolutely shudder to think that what would be the result of her arrival there what her powers were I knew, and I could not doubt but that she would exercise them to the full. It might be possible to control her for a while, but her proud, ambitious spirit would be certain to break loose and avenge itself for the long centuries of its solitude. She would, if necessary, and if the power of her beauty did not unaided prove equal to the occasion, blast her way to any end she set before her, and as she could not die, and for aught I knew could not even be killed, what was there to stop her? I regret to say that I was never able to ascertain if she was invulnerable against the ordinary accidents of life. Presumably this was so, else some misadventure would have been sure to put an end to her in the course of so many centuries. True, she offered to let Leo slay her, but very probably this was only an experiment to try his temper and mental attitude towards her. Asha never gave way to impulse without some valid object. L. H. H. In the end, she would, I had little doubt, assume absolute rule over the British dominions, and probably over the whole earth, and though I was sure that she would speedily make ours the most glorious and prosperous empire that the world has ever seen, it would be at the cost of a terrible sacrifice of life. The whole thing sounded like a dream or some extraordinary invention of a speculative brain, and yet it was a fact, a wonderful fact, of which the whole world would soon be called on to take notice. What was the meaning of it all? After much thinking, I could only conclude that this marvellous creature, whose passion had kept her for so many centuries, chained as it were, and comparatively harmless, was now about to be used by providence as a means to change the order of the world, and possibly by the building up of a power that could no more be rebelled against, or questioned, than the decrees of fate, to change it materially for the better. End of chapter 22 Recording by Red Abras January 2008